So again, I'm Patrick Byers, Horticulture Field Specialist with University of Missouri Extension, and we'll be talking about beginning in bee beekeeping this evening. And again, this is a, a uh, just a very brief introduction to several aspects of beekeeping. It's, it's designed to pique your interest and, and hopefully uh, encourage a, a, a further investigation of the joys and, and pleasures of beekeeping. This is an outline of what I'd like to cover tonight. And again, this is just an overview of beekeeping. And um, as we go through the material, as I've mentioned this before, but as we go through the material, please uh, ask any questions and we'll tackle them. Well, first of all, I'll have an introduction and a bit of a reality check for those who are thinking about beekeeping. We'll talk about the history and the importance of honeybees. Honeybees and humans have been associated for millennia, and it's a very interesting and very important relationship. Then we'll talk about honeybees themselves. We'll talk about their physical characteristics and a bit about their life cycles and their biology. And then we'll get into sort of the, the main part of our time here tonight, and that's getting started in beekeeping. And we'll talk about hive types, we'll talk about equipment, and we'll talk about obtaining bees. And um, we'll have several videos to supplement uh, this part of the presentation. We'll have a discussion on pest diseases and integrated pest management. Now, we're not going to be able to go into detail. Again, this is definitely the subject matter of several workshops. But we will look at varroa mites as a case study from the standpoint of integrated pest management of honeybee problems. We'll talk about honeybees and pollination. And we'll talk about bee products. And then we'll wind up with just a discussion of keeping honeybees in urban areas. That's a little bit different than keeping honeybees on the farm. But I know that several of the folks who are on the uh, webinar this evening uh, live, in, live in urban areas. And they may be considering uh, becoming beekeepers in an urban setting. So you're interested in keeping bees. Well, I, I salute you, I congratulate you. It can be the start of a fascinating hobby and, and perhaps even a venture into the commercial aspects of beekeeping. But again, it's important to do a reality check. You know, First of all, is this going to be a hobby or are you thinking about it from the standpoint of making money from your, your uh, beekeeping enterprise? Uh, very important to think about that because you're gonna have a different approach to uh, the material that I'll cover tonight if you're a hobbyist than if you're a commercial beekeeper. Um, are these bees going to be in your backyard, just a few hives, uh, something that you manage for the pleasure of it? Or is it going to grow to the scale again where you might be considering uh, commercial production of bees and bee products? How many hives do you want to have? Uh, do you plan to make money from pollination services? This is definitely an opportunity for those uh, for, for beekeepers. Now it comes with some challenges as we'll talk about a little bit later on in the presentation. Or, and is your goal making money, uh, perhaps selling honey, perhaps selling other bee products? So again, ask yourself these questions at the very beginning of your interest in beekeeping. And, and honestly, many people start out as hobbyist beekeepers. And as I said before, it can be a very enjoyable, very fulfilling hobby. And then as they discover they have an aptitude and an interest in beekeeping, then perhaps they expand to the commercial scale. So oftentimes people's experience with beekeeping is, is a bit of a journey, starting at the hobby level and then expanding on perhaps into a, a larger scale production. And now for the reality check, bees will sting, you will get stung, and it hurts. Now, uh, there are people who have a sensitivity to bee stings, and there are beekeepers who have sensitivities to bee stings, and they keep EpiPens and, and other antidotes close at hand. But keep in mind that if you do have a sensitive to, to bee, if you're sensitive to bee venom, it may be a, a bit of a sign, a bit of a signal that perhaps beekeeping is not for you, because it is inevitable that people who keep bees will get stung. Secondly, bees will not recognize you as a friend. Uh, quite frankly, it's a bit of a truce between the beekeeper and the honeybee. And in fact, as you work with, with, uh, with honeybees, and in many cases, they perceive you as the enemy. And the, the way that you manage them is, is in an effort to overcome this, this um, uh, alarm reaction, which is natural. You know, you think about opening a hive, this is pretty disruptive from the standpoint of the honeybee. And uh, uh, that it's, it's just important to recognize that, that honeybees do not become your friends. Beekeeping is, is expensive. We'll talk a little bit about the costs of getting into beekeeping a little bit later on. Bees do not take care of themselves. It's a mistake to, to go to the expense to establish a colony and then not manage it because bees will not take care of themselves. And in fact, in, in today's atmosphere with, with some of the uh, pest issues with bees, if they're not managed, if a colony is not managed, Sooner or later, it will likely succumb to, to one or more problems. Uh, beekeeping can be physically taxing. Lifting the equipment, lifting uh, uh, bee boxes or supers can be physically exhausting. 
and particularly if, if a, a, a person expands to the scale of commercial beekeeping. So this must be kept in mind too. It's risky to try to make money with beekeeping. And those people who have, uh, have had long-term success with beekeeping have, have figured out how to overcome those risks. And, and again, uh, it's a reality check that you can make a bit of money off of a backyard, um, uh, backyard apiary, but from the standpoint of, of uh, uh, a commercial venture into beekeeping, you typically have to go big. Now, what does big mean? Um, many commercial beekeepers will tell you that, that that's around 50 colonies. So it is important to recognize that if you decide to go the route of commercial beekeeping, that you're going to have to go, go big. Now let's talk a little bit about the history and the importance of honeybees. This is a very interesting picture here. This is actually a, a cave painting. This was found in a cave in France, and it's to believe, believed to be one of the earliest depictions of a human harvesting honey. And again, if you look at this uh, uh, with, with uh, you know, a bit of an abstract eye, you can see a person uh, obviously clinging to a tree or perhaps to the side of a wall or, or a cliff reaching into to something and, and putting something into a container that they're holding. But what perhaps is most revealing are the, uh, the objects flying around that person, which to my eye look like honeybees. So again, this association between humans and honeybees goes back millennia, goes back to, to the early part of our experience as, as, uh, as humans, and certainly back to the period of time when we were hunters or gatherers. Uh, it's been said that oftentimes the, uh, one of the most important quests among humans is the quest for sweetness. And, um, honey is a naturally occurring sweetener, and it was widely utilized in the ancient world. And so again, looking at this picture, we can imagine uh, one of our, our early ancestors harvesting honey and, and braving the stings of those bees that are flying around. When we talk about the uh, European honeybee, it, it, it can be helpful to understand um, uh, its uh, uh, species relationship. And, and certainly it's in the, the animal kingdom, it's in the arthropod phylum which includes uh, things such as insects, spiders, and uh, a number of other organisms that have outer skeletons or exoskeletons. It be belongs to the class Insecta. Belongs to the order Hymenoptera. And uh, Hymenoptera includes a number of other insects of interest. It includes wasps. It includes uh, uh, the ants. And uh, certainly it includes the honeybees and, and, and their relatives. Uh, the honeybee belongs to the family Apidae, and it's the genus Apis and the species Apis mellifera. And it's interesting when we look at uh, that, that word, uh, Apis mellifera, these are two Latin words that mean honey bearing. So again, from the very beginning, when, when uh, this insect was named, it was, it was named in honor of the fact that it is definitely a honey bearing insect. Now, you sometimes hear the term apiculture or apiary. Uh, apiculture is bee, beekeeping. An apiary area is, is an area where honeybee hives are kept, and those are derived from the Latin name of the European honeybee, which is, of course, apis. Now, the early history of the honeybee. Again, humans and, and honeybees have been connected for at least 8,000 years, and likely longer, too, and honey was the earliest of sweeteners. Um, honeybees are not native to the New World. They're not native to North America. They're actually an Old World species, and uh, the nearest indications we have is that uh, the uh, European honeybee likely originated somewhere in, in uh, Eastern or Southern Europe. Uh, early on, it was brought to the New World, and it was brought to the New World certainly because, you know, honey was an important sweetener. But uh, again, fairly quickly, it was recognized that uh, honeybees had a value as pollinators, and we'll talk more about that here in a moment. And then perhaps not as important today, but very important in the past, was the wax produced by honeybees. And in fact, much of the early beekeeping was uh, done with the goal of harvesting the wax that honeybees produce. Now, as far as the importance of the honeybee, you know, certainly there's a relationship between humans and honeybees, but uh, it goes beyond just a, uh, uh, a source of something sweet. And honeybees actually co-evolved along with modern agriculture. In other words, the, the uh, the relationship with humans evolved along with the development of modern agriculture by humans. And humans recognized early on that honeybees were a partner with many of the crops that they wished to grow. We'll talk more about that when we get to our section on pollination. Honeybees perform five to 30% of pollination. Uh, it's been estimated that uh, one in 10 or perhaps even more than that uh, mouthfuls of food that we eat is uh, there directly as the result of honeybee pollination. 
And in fact, if we look at the value of honeybees in agriculture, they're worth more as pollinators than as honey producers. And uh, again, native, native pollinators certainly have a role to play. And, and we, we wanna recognize that, but honeybees are crucial and partly because honeybees can be managed and partly because honeybees can be moved. And a little bit later on, we'll talk about migratory beekeeping and migratory pollination. So some milestones in, in the recent relationship between honeybees and humans. Uh, the gentleman in this picture, Reverend Lorenzo Langstroth, uh, we, we should all uh, bow our heads in thanksgiving to a Reverend Langstroth. Uh, he early on recognized something, a very important concept called the bee space. And we'll talk more about that here in a moment as well. But in 1852, he patented the movable frame hive. And this was the first uh, commercially available hive where a beekeeper could take it apart into pieces and pull out components and examine the bees. Uh, prior to Reverend Langstroth's uh, uh, development, bees were kept in things such as hollow logs or, uh, or straw baskets or, or boxes. And in these settings, the, uh, the uh, bees would fill the area with comb and with, with uh, honey. But when it came time to harvest the honey, the only alternative was to destroy the colony. But with the Langstroth hive, as we'll talk about here in a moment, we can now pull components out, we can brush the bees off, and we can harvest honey and wax from those components without destroying the colony. So again, this was a, a revolutionary development. 1857, we saw the invention of comb foundation. We'll talk more about that here in a moment. But that is the material that we can place within the Langstroth hive to help guide the development of the honeycomb within the hive. 1865, the invention of the honey extractor. Again, prior to having honey extractors, honey was, was collected by crushing the comb and uh, collecting the honey. Again, this was, was obviously disruptive to the colony. But with a honey extractor now, combined with a Langstroth hive, we can now pull frames out. We can cut the caps off those frames. And with the extractor, we can, we can uh, drive the honey out of the comb and then replace the frames and the uh, comb back into the hive. 1865, we saw the importation of Italian honeybee queens into uh, the United States. And this was a huge development. We'll talk more about Italian honeybees here in a moment, but it proved to be a very productive, very easily managed strain of honeybee. 1883, the first US bee laws. Uh, beekeeping is regulated by the USDA and commercial beekeepers have to adhere to the uh, regulations in place at, at the federal level. There are also state laws that regulate beekeeping. 1998, uh, this is a fairly recent development, but movable frame hives were required for, for most commercial beekeeping applications. And then 2006, this was the first year that we had a widespread report of colony collapse disorder. This has been extremely disruptive to beekeeping, both at the hobby level and also at the commercial level. And for example, in the seven years between 2006 and 2013, uh, US beekeepers lost 10 million colonies. This is just an astonishing number. And we'll talk more about colony collapse disorder a little bit later on. Now, where are we as far as colony numbers in the United States? Well, at the present uh, time, we are definitely down from the peak. The peak was in 1947 when we had 6 million hives. Uh, the most recent information we have was as the result of the US Census of Agriculture in 2017, where it was estimated that there were 2.62 million colonies. Um, in 2016, there were about 125,000 beekeepers. Uh, 1,600 of these were commercial beekeepers. The rest were people like you and I, hobbyists who had less than 25 colonies or part-time uh, commercial beekeepers who had less than 300 colonies. So again, um, the uh, 1,600 commercial beekeepers, they account for a good part of the, the bee colonies, but hobbyists and part-time beekeepers are important as well. And we're seeing this huge, huge uh, building of interest in beekeeping, especially in urban areas. And again, I suspect many of the folks on the, uh, the workshop this evening may live in urban or suburban areas and are thinking about uh, beekeeping. Some of you may already have hives. Okay, now let's talk about honeybee biology. It's a fascinating insect. And I think it's important to understand biology to become a, a good beekeeper. We have to understand how bees function, what's, what is important about their life cycles and, uh, and uh, their behaviors so that we can adapt what we do to help manage their colonies effectively. 
So a honeybee life cycle is uh, from, from egg to adult is about 21 days in the case of a worker bee. It's a few days longer in the case of a, of a queen or a, uh, a drone bee. But basically there are four life stages for a honeybee. Those stages are egg, larva, pupae, and adult. And so the egg is laid and in six days it hatches into the larva. And then the larva is in place uh, until about day 15. At that point, it pupates, forms the pupa. And then about day 21 is when the pupa then hatches or, or uh, uh, develops into the adult bee. So again, a uh, very interesting life cycle, but not all that unusual compared to other insects. And again, an egg for, for about the first three days, a larva then from day four to day 10, a pupa from day 11 to day 20. The uh, uh, developing larva and the pupa are tended by uh, the, the worker bees, and then the worker bees cap the cell. The uh, uh, pupa then, when it emerges as a new adult, the new adult chews out of the cell and becomes a, 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 a productive part of the hive. Now, as far as the adult life cycle, uh, the adult worker bees, begin life as what are called nurse bees. They stay in the colony, they tend to the eggs, to the developing larva. They have housekeeping duties, they tend to the queen. And this lasts for about the first 22 days or so of their lives. And then from, from that point on, they become foraging adults if it's during the, uh, the uh, uh, nectar flow, during the time of the season when, when flowers are blossoming and producing nectar. And they, they uh, will then be uh, foraging adults that leave the hive collect nectar and pollen and return back to the hive with, with those important foodstuffs for the colony. Now, within the, the honeybee colony, there are three castes or, or types of bees. And these are the queen, the worker, and the drone. And we'll talk more about the roles of each one here in a moment. But each of these castes has a specific role in, in the colony, and they all work together for the good of the colony. When we think about cooperative behavior, a honeybee colony is, is an excellent example. And when everything is, is going right, the, uh, the honeybee colony is productive. It produces enough honey and enough uh, stored foods to support the life of the colony with excess that can then be collected by the beekeeper. Now, if the caste system is not working properly, if there's disruption of the, uh, the behavior patterns within the colony, then we have problems and we can have declines in colonies or even, even colony die off because of problems with, with uh, the behavior of one or more of the uh, honeybee casts. So let's talk about the queen first. The queen is the largest honeybee in the colony and there's usually only one per colony. Um, she's typically about 18 to 20 millimeters long. She's the longest lived bee in the colony. She can have a lifespan of up to six years. Her job in the colony, again, is to control the behavior of the colony and to lay eggs. And she lays lots of eggs, up to 1,500 eggs per day. Um, it's very interesting, the, the, uh, uh, when, it, when a, a uh, queen hatches, when, when she emerges from the cell where she develops, she's a virgin, she's not mated. She goes on a mating flight, she mates at that time with, with several drones, which we'll talk about here in a moment, but that's the only time she mates. And then she stores up enough spermatozoa in her body to continuously fertilize eggs at the rate of up to 1500 eggs per day for a number of years. It's just remarkable to consider that. Now, the uh, queen has the ability to choose whether or not she lays fertilized or unfertilized eggs. Uh, the fertilized eggs that she lay, lays become females. And uh, the uh, diet that these developing females are fed, the female larvae are fed, determines whether or not they'll develop into worker bees, which are females as well, or into additional queens. Um, if she lays unfertilized eggs, these become drones. And the queen basically controls the behavior of the hive. She holds the hive together through the production of pheromones. We'll talk more about pheromones here in a moment as well. But pheromones are scents that are released by bees in response to, to particular uh, circumstances. And the queen releases a series of pheromones that help direct the behavior of the bees, both within the hive and, and as they forage. And again, if a bee is old or if a bee is, is otherwise, a queen is, is old or otherwise in decline, uh, this affects her production of pheromones. And this in turn can affect the behavior of, of, of the uh, worker bees where they might actually begin to uh, develop new queens to replace a failing queen. So again, a lot of the management of a hive comes down to sense, comes down to pheromones. <laughs> 
Now, a new queen, a virgin queen, after hatching, she'll make mating flights. And those are flights up into the air uh, above the uh, colony. At that point, uh, it's interesting to watch this happen. As she leaves the colony, the drones that are present will immediately fly up after her in spiraling flights, and they actually mate in midair. Uh, she can make up to five to seven mating flights. She can mate with up to 15 drones during that period of time. And then again, she stores that sperm in her body from that point on. She doesn't mate again. And it, again, it's, it's just fascinating to me that, that the queen can determine whether or not an egg is fertilized as she lays it. Uh, after the mating flight, she, re she returns to the hive and that she does not leave the hive again during her lifetime unless she joins a swarm. She may live up to six years. And again, she's tended by the worker bees and she controls their behavior through the production of pheromones. The worker bee, by far the majority of the bees in a colony in a hive are female worker bees. There can be up to 60,000 worker bees present in a strong colony at the peak of the season. Typically a worker bee has a fairly short lifespan and it's partly because they work for that entire lifespan. Uh, typically during the, uh, the uh, uh, flowering season, during the spring, summer and fall, it's about a six week lifespan. Now the bees that are present during the winter, the, the worker bees will live a longer period of time. They can actually live for the better part of the winter. But again, bees don't have a, worker bees don't have a long lifespan because they quite frankly work themselves to death. They do all of the work. They're the guard bees, they're the nurse bees. They take care of housekeeping activities, you know, cleaning the hive and, and uh, removing debris, et cetera. And they're also the foragers that gather pollen and nectar that provide the stores that support the life of the hive. They're about 10 to 15 millimeters long. And again, as we mentioned earlier, uh, when a worker bee emerges from, from her cell, she spends about four weeks as a house bee, as a nurse bee in the hive, and then she becomes a forager for the remainder of her lifespan. The drone beans are male. The, uh, the drone bee develops from an unfertilized egg. Uh, drones do no work in the hive. In fact, they, <laughs> quite frankly, are, are a bit of a drain on the hive. The workers must feed them. Uh, they, they loaf around on the hive. They get in the way of activities. They're a little bit larger than worker bees. They're about 15 to 17 millimeters long. Uh, they don't have a stinger. They have large eyes, as we can see. And, and the, one of the reasons they have large eyes is really their only job in life is to mate with the queen. And as the uh, virgin queen leaves on her mating flights, those eyes serve the drones well to pursue her into the air. Um, after they mate, they die, and if there are any left in the hive in the fall, the uh, worker bees, quite frankly, kick them out. They're, they're kicked out of the hive and then they perish. Now let's take a little uh, bit of a, of a look at a bee and its body. And when we look particularly at worker bees, we notice that uh, they're hairy. Most of their body is covered with hairs of, of, of uh, one sort or another. And particularly when, when the bees are young, they, their bodies are, are thickly covered with hairs. As bees age, and particularly foraging bees, as they've been working, oftentimes they'll wear some of this hair off. But this hair is important because it traps and transfers pollen. We'll see a picture here in a moment that, that shows how effective the body of the bee is in, trans, in trapping and transferring pollen. And once the pollen is collected on the bee's body, then the bee can actually uh, groom that pollen and collect it in what's called the pollen basket or the corbiculae. And this is found on their, their uh, rear legs. The uh, body color of the honeybee can vary depending upon its race. Some bees are nearly black, others are golden or almost yellow in color. Uh, in addition to the corbicula, the uh, bee has wax glands on its body. And these wax glands, of course, are used to produce beeswax, which is used to draw out the comb in which um, uh, larval bees develop and, and in which uh, bees store pollen and, uh, and honey. And then at the tip of the abdomen, the bee has a stinger. Now, the uh, stinger anatomy, which we'll see here in a moment, is barbed on workers. And a worker can only sting once. Once, a, If a worker bee stings, the uh, barbs on the, uh, the uh, stinger stay behind in whatever the, the worker bee stung. And as the worker bee draws away, it actually pulls out the venom sac and a portion of the uh, honeybee's anatomy. And the honeybee then, the worker bee then quickly dies. Uh, the um, stinger on a queen is smooth. It does not stay behind in whatever's being stung. And typically, the only reason that the queen bee would use its stinger would be to sting other competing queens within the colony. Here's a couple of interesting pictures. If we look at the uh, picture on the left, we can see a, a 
worker bee foraging on dead nettle. Dead nettle is an early season. It's a cool season wheat, but it blooms early and it's an important pollen source for honeybees early in the season. And you notice that orange spot on the forehead of the honeybee. Well, the uh, floral arrangement in dead nettle has the stamens which produce the pollen on the top of the flower. And as the honeybee pushes her head into that flower to seek the nectar at the base of the flower, her head comes into contact with the, uh, the stamens and she gets a heavy dusting of pollen on her forehead. And then she, as she pulls away, she'll groom that off. And you'll notice in the lower picture, those uh, uh, reddish colored areas. Those are the uh, corbiculae, the uh, pollen baskets on the hind legs of this worker bee. And she has actually groomed the pollen off of her head and her body and collected it there so she can carry it back to the hive on her legs. Now the honey stomach, you know, we sometimes hear people say, well, honey is, is just something bees eat and then they throw back up. But in fact, a honeybee has a separate organ called the honey stomach where the uh, uh, nectar that she collects from a flower is stored on the way back to the hive. And if we look at this picture, we can see there in her abdomen, the honey stomach, it is separate from her, her uh, 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 normal stomach, you know, where she takes in food, digests it, and then excretes through the rectum. The honey stomach, uh, is a separate organ. It allows her to draw in honey through her mouth parts. The honey is stored in the honey stomach. And then when she gets back to the hive, she regurgitates the, the nectar where it's placed into uh, cells and then the excess moisture is uh, ev evaporated. So again, it's definitely separate from her regular stomach and does no digestion. Now let's take a look at the stinger. And again, as I said before, if you're interested in keeping bees sooner or later, you're going to be stung. Um, the stinger is, of course, a defense mechanism, and um, it's found at the tip of the abdomen, the, the, the third body part of, of the worker bee and the uh, queen bee. And in the case of the worker bee, it's, it's barbed. And if we look closely at that picture on the right, we can see the barbs out near the tip of the, uh, the stinger. Now, the stinger actually has two parts that actually move in unison after uh, someone is stung or after something is stung, and it actually works its way into the flesh of whatever was stung. Um, the uh, venom sac contains the uh, bee venom and it is connected to the, uh, the stinger by what's called the bulb. And again, if you look at the picture on the left, you can see those parts of the, uh, of the stinger. The valves actually uh, open up when the stinging takes place, releases the venom into the stinger. And then as the bee draws away, the stinger, the bulb and the venom sac are pulled out of its abdomen and they remain behind in the wound uh, for a period of time, the venom sac will continue to pump venom into the wound. And as I said before, the, the uh, parts of the stinger will continue to move and draw the stinger deeper into the, uh, the flesh of whatever has been stung. Now, a bit of advice, if you get stung, it's important to remove the stinger as quickly as possible. Now, you don't wanna do this by squeezing it and pulling it out, because if you squeeze it with your fingers, you actually will force additional venom into the wound. It's better to take a thumbnail or the blade of a knife or the uh, blade of a uh, hive tool and scrape the stinger out of, out of your body. That way you remove it, uh, you don't press the venom further into, into the wound. And the sooner you do that, the less venom will be injected. If you wait a period of time, obviously more venom will be injected. And then some thoughts on pheromones. So many animals communicate by way of pheromones. And this includes humans, believe it or not. Uh, it's, it's a way that we, we communicate, we meaning animals, communicate beyond behavior, beyond uh, other cues. And uh, these scents can have many different purposes. Uh, honeybees, again, are, are very much rely upon scents to keep the hive operating smoother. They rely upon these pheromones. Uh, there are numerous pheromones that have been identified in relationship to honeybees, but there's three that we're particularly interested in as far as beekeepers. Okay, the first is the queen pheromone. This is the pheromone that the queen releases that, that controls the behavior of the hive. And again, a strong, healthy queen releases uh, the right type of pheromone. It's in the right concentration in the hive and all goes well. But if she's failing or if she's been injured, then oftentimes pheromone production will be disrupted and the colony can sense this. And immediately they'll go into survival mode. They'll try to produce additional queens to replace the failing or the injured queen. The orientation pheromone, this is a very important pheromones that uh, honeybees release that helps communicate or helps guide them uh, to and from the colony. It's also a pheromone that is released within the colony to guide movement within the colony. And so again, that's very interesting. 
Uh, it's also an important pheromone that's released during the swarming process. And if we look at this picture here, we can see a swarm up in a peach tree and we can see all the bees flying in the same direction towards the, uh, the uh, swarm. And this is because the uh, worker bees have released pheromones that help guide this sort of behavior. And the balling or the massing of the bees within the swarm, again, is as a result of these orientation pheromones. And then the third pheromone, the one that sooner or later you'll experience is the alarm pheromone. And when you're working with bees as you open colonies and, and look at the inner workings, sooner or later you're going to catch a whiff of the alarm pheromone. And it's, it's a, a scent that you can recognize. It smells a bit like bananas, but again, very noticeable. And when you smell that pheromone, again, that is a response of bees to something that's disrupted the colony. And the, the response when something is disrupting the colony is first of all, investigation, and secondly, stinging. So uh, when we manage colonies, uh, if we begin to smell that pheromone, it's a good, good uh, sign that perhaps we need to do something about that, either back away and let things calm down, or perhaps through the judicious and careful use of smoke, we can actually disrupt the alarm pheromones and, and help, um, help calm the bees help make them more docile and easy to work. Now let's talk about honeybee strains. So when we think about um, honey producing bees, you know, there, there are literally thousands of bees, but there's really only a few that produce honey in quantity enough that they can be harvested by humans. And these include the giant bees of Asia, the uh, uh, little honeybee and Eastern honeybee, again, of Asia and Europe, and then the Western honeybee, primarily of Europe. Notice that none of these are native to North America. Uh, the uh, the uh, bee species that we have in this country are very important from the standpoint of pollination and, and, and other, other aspects, but uh, they're not honey producing bees. Uh, Apis mellifera, which is the Western honeybee, is by far the dominant honeybee species in the world, and it was early on brought to the US. Now it's made up of several subspecies that are capable of interbreeding. And in, in uh, many cases, these have been developed into what we call strains. There's at least nine different races or strains of honeybees. And uh, again, these would be related to those that are recognized by, by beekeepers. There's likely many, many more when we take into consideration uh, feral bees. But from the standpoint of, of um, uh, apiculture, from the standpoint of beekeeping, uh, these are the primary types of honeybees that are kept. And each race has positive and negative attributes. You know, some, for example, are, are uh, types of bees that build up strength early in the spring. Others have uh, hygienic behavior where they groom themselves and help dislodge uh, external parasites. Others produce a lot of honey. Others are, are more defensive about their colonies. Some even have negative attributes. A good example would be Africanized bees, which are, are uh, honeybees, yes, but they have developed aggressive tendencies. Uh, these races actually allow for specialization in, in the apiary. Now we have some standard races that have been uh, part of beekeeping for many, many years. You know, Italian bees are, are uh, probably one of the most widely kept um, races of honeybees in that lower picture there. Again, on the dead nettle, that's an example of an Italian bee. They're golden in color with dark bands on their abdomens. The German black bee, this is one of the first honeybees brought to North America. Very hardy bees, not perhaps as productive as Italians, but uh, uh, generally very straightforward to manage. And the uh, picture there uh, showing the honeybee foraging on dill is an example of a German black bee. Notice how much darker it is than the Italian bee. Two other races of bees that are, that are, are widely known and widely kept are the Carniolan and the Caucasian. We have several new races of honeybees. And We'll talk about um, integrated pest management here in the moment, but one aspect of integrated pest management is developing honeybee races that have behaviors that make them less susceptible to bee problems. And in the case of, of uh, buckfast bees, and in the case of Minnesota hygienic bees, they actually have behavior patterns that help overcome some of the problems related to uh, varroa mite, which we'll talk about here in, in a bit. Let's talk just a bit about Italian honeybees. I'm not going to have enough time this evening to go into each of the races, but uh, we'll talk about um, honeybees or Italian honeybees. They uh, came to this country from Italy in uh, 1859. Uh, they're beautiful bees, just, just lovely, lovely bees. They're, they're pale yellow to light brown. They have uh, those dark stripes on their abdomen. They're very popular among beekeepers. They have a fast spring buildup. They're less prone to swarming. Uh, 
They're excellent comb producers. And very importantly for beginners, they're docile. They're, they're easy to work with. And they're forgiving. Again, for beginners, you know, you're going to make mistakes. You're going to do things that alarm the bees. But Italian honeybees are forgiving. They're docile. And they're strong honey producers. Uh, the disadvantage, they do require more winter stores than, say, more hardy bees, such as, um, such as German blacks. They don't handle cold and damp very well. They're probably better suited. Uh, Missouri is fine, but if we were talking about keeping bees in the northern parts of uh, North America, there are better strains for those settings. And they do have a strong tendency to rob other colonies. Um, another disadvantage I'll mention is they don't have some of the hygienic behavior that we're seeing in strains like the Minnesota hygienic, which can be so important from the standpoint of managing some of these uh, bee problems such as Varroa mites. Well, let's talk about uh, getting started now. And um, now we're going to move into more of a discussion of the, the, the mechanics of beekeeping, you know, some, some thoughts on equipment, types of hives, uh, uh, you know, basic things that, that are important to know as you get started with bees. And so we'll start the discussion by, by talking about hive types. So honeybees in nature, you know, if you, if you are blessed with a feral bee colony, you'll, you'll, you can find that they'll make their home in, in lots of different places. What they need basically is a protected cavity. This is my bee tree. It's a uh, silver maple tree that's partially hollow. And about oh, 15 feet up in the air, there's a knot hole. And the bees have been coming into and out of that knot hole for seven years. And it's just fascinating to watch them as they fly in and out. And of course, it's a blessing to have a uh, feral colony in my yard because they provide pollination services for my vegetable garden free of charge. But you can find them not only in hollow trees, but you can find them in abandoned, abandoned buildings. You can find them in the uh, wall cavities of houses. You can find them in um, caves. You can find them in, in protected areas on rock faces. There are lots of places where you can find honeybee colonies in nature. But when we start to think about managing bees, when we start to think about becoming beekeepers, we're starting to think about hives. And as I mentioned before, the first efforts at keeping bees were bees kept in, in clay jars, in, in pieces of hollow logs, in straw baskets. And again, this can, can be an effective way to keep bees, but when it's time to harvest the honey, you have to destroy the colony. So again, as I mentioned before, the Langstroth hive developed by Reverend Langstroth was, was a revolutionary development. Uh, the greatest advancement in beekeeping, is, you know, it's been described that way. Uh, basically, what uh, Reverend Langstroth did was he measured nests in the wild. And if you've ever come upon a, uh, a uh, feral bee colony in, you know, in a tree where, or, or some setting where you can actually see the comb, you'll notice that the comb is produced in sheets. And there's oftentimes several sheets of comb that are adjacent to each other. And so what Le Reverend Langstroth did was he observed these, these wild colonies, these wild nests, and he measured the distances between these sheets of comb. And he came up with the concept of the bee space. He noticed that there was a fairly uniform distance between these sections of a feral colony. And he called this the bee space. It's about three eighths, inch, three eighths inches or about a centimeter. And he noticed that if there was a wider space than this, then the bees built what's called burr comb that connected these, these main parts of their colony together, the, the nest together. And if it was smaller than 3 8 inch, they filled it up with what's called propolis. And propolis is a, a, uh, a resin, a sticky substance the bees collect from trees. It's basically uh, uh, exudate from tree buds. And I've heard it called bee glue because bees use it in the colony to, to, to stabilize the colony. So again, with small spaces, they fill those spaces with propolis. If the space is wider than 3 8 of an inch, they build burr comb. But if it's right around 3 8 of an inch or, or around a centimeter, then they keep that space open as an area in which to work and travel and, and produce cap cells and, and, and those sorts of things you know, to support the activity of the hive. So Reverend Langstroth took this concept into a setting where he could place frames into a box and then maintaining that space between the frames, he could then remove these frames. The Langstroth hive is what's called a movable frame design. We can pull it apart, we can pull each frame out, we can look at each frame and inspect it if necessary. And we can recombine the components. We can move frames around. We can divide colonies. Again, a very revolutionary uh, advancement in beekeeping, the development of the Langstroth beehive. Uh, 
Okay, let's talk about the modern Langstroth hive. And again, you can see my daughter here working with the Langstroth hive. She's getting ready to put the inner cover on. So there's several parts, and I have a video here in a moment to, to illustrate these parts, but starting from the base and working up, we have the hive stand, and this keeps the hive off the ground. Now, again, in the previous picture, uh, we use concrete blocks to keep the hive off the ground, but oftentimes there's a special box that is built to keep the hive up off the ground. Um, I'll, I'll mention here that uh, when we talk about some of the hazards of beekeeping, one of the things to consider is that as you move hives around, they're up off the ground, and as you lift them off a hive stand, you want to be careful about what might be underneath. There have been cases where there have been skunks or possums or, or copperheads taking shelter under beehives, so be a little cautious when you lift a hive off the hive stand. As far as the, uh, the hive itself, we have the bottom board, which is the base or the foundation of the hive. Then we have the hive body. This is sometimes called the brood box. Uh, it's a box of some depth, typically nine and a half inches. There can be more than one box that forms the hive body, but we'll see more about that here in a moment. Then above the hive body, we have what's called the queen excluder. And the queen excluder is a screen. And this screen actually keeps the queen in the hive body. Remember that the queen is the largest bee in the colony. She's definitely smaller than the worker bees. And the screen that, that forms the queen excluder has a mesh that is large enough to allow worker bees to pass through, but small enough that the queen cannot pass it. Then above the queen excluder, we have honey supers, which is where the bees store the excess honey. On the top of that, we have the inner cover. And then on the top of the inner cover, we have the outer cover. And there's two types of outer covers. One is called the telescoping cover. That's what most of us will be using uh, as, as um, uh, backyard beekeepers or, or hobby beekeepers. It comes down over the sides of the hive. Uh, those large scale beekeepers who are moving hives around, particularly for pollination purposes, have what are called migratory covers. These are flat covers that allow hives to be stacked on top of each other. You know, for example, to load onto a truck to move to a new site. And again, here's a diagram showing the uh, parts of the Langstroth hive. The bee stand, the bottom board, the deep super, the queen excluder, the honey supers, the inner cover, and the outer cover. Now, what's inside the hive? Well, inside the hive, we have frames. In a, in a typical Langstroth hive, we have 10 frames, and we can see this beekeeper holding a frame. The frames are constructed from wood, the framework is, sometimes uh, plastic, there are now plastic frames. And then within the frame is placed the foundation. And the foundation guides the bees in developing the, uh, the uh, uh, comb. And the foundation is placed in the center of the frame and the bees build out in both directions. And it, it uh, we'll see again here in, in, in a moment, there is a pattern on the, uh, the uh, foundation that guides the development of the cells. And the uh, uh, foundation can be made from natural beeswax or it can be a more durable wax coated plastic. Bees build the comb in the frame. The frames are, are uh, designed in such a way that they maintain the bee space when they're adjacent to each other within the, uh, the uh, box, be it a honey super or the uh, brood box. Uh, brood frames used in the brood chamber and honey uh, frames are used in the uh, honey supers. Now there are other hive designs. First of all, the top bar hive. Uh, sometimes these are called coffin hives for, uh, for obvious reasons. Uh, rather than being a vertical hive like the Langstroth hive where you, you stack components higher and higher, this is a horizontal hive where the bees are forced to work in a, in a horizontal fashion. And bees typically don't work this way in nature. And uh, so it's somewhat contrary to their normal behavior patterns. Uh, it's cheap and easy to build. There's no standard size. And there is a bar suspended inside under the, uh, the uh, top of the bar hive. And the bees just build comb suspended from this top bar. There's no frames, for example, for support. Now, obviously, it's more difficult to examine this colony. And when it comes time to harvest the honey, frequently this is done by just drawing the comb out and crushing the comb to, to uh, uh, draw forth the honey. Top bar hives are more difficult to manage, uh, less straightforward than a Langstroth hive and typically are, are, are not the best way for beginning beekeepers, but for those who are more advanced and wanna try it out, uh, yeah, it can, be, it can be an interesting experience to work with top bar hives. The horizontal hive is somewhat like a, a uh, uh, top bar hive and it's somewhat like a Langstroth hive. It's actually a, a hive 
that is a Langstroth hive from the standpoint of having movable frames, but it's a much longer hive. It, it holds many more than, than the typical nine to 10 frames found in a standard Langstroth hive. So in this case, bees have to work both, both horizontally, again, which is, is um, somewhat contrary to, uh, to their, their normal tendencies. We use Langstroth frames in, in horizontal hives. And again, it's not standard and typically not a good design for new beekeepers to start with. Then there's the war hive, which is a combination of a Langstroth and the top bar. It's a vertical hive, uh, but it uses top bars within each box rather than frames. And again, with, with this approach, it's more difficult to manage. It's much more difficult to examine the colony and it's more difficult to uh, extract the, uh, the honey. And quite frankly, war hives are used most frequently in situations where the person managing that hive is more interested in the bees themselves than in the honey that might be developed by the colony. In other words, if uh, the goal was to develop uh, a strong colony for pollination purposes, this would be one way to do it. And then the most recently developed hive design is the flow hive. And I'll be honest, I don't know a lot about flow hives. I've not worked with them myself. I've read a bit about their design. Um, with this type of a setting, you have a special type of uh, foundation and a special type of frame within the hive. And it's a type where the honey, as it's produced, actually percolates through the frame and collects in an area where you can draw it off without actually pulling out the frames and extracting the honey. Uh, there's some question about the durability of these hives. There's some question about whether or not bees are, are uh, uh, as, as productive you know, the, in, in this sort of a setting. But particularly from a, uh, a, a hobby standpoint, it might be interesting to try a flow hive. Bees produce lots of propolis in, in uh, response to flow hives. And this has to be recognized. It can make it a challenge to break the hive down and examine it. Okay, now let's talk a bit about beekeeping equipment. So what do you need to get started about with in, in beekeeping? Well, your basic needs, of course, are, are the hive. We talked about the parts of a Langstroth hive and it's certainly recommended that new beekeepers start with a Langstroth hive. You need some basic tools. What do you need? Well, quite frankly, a hive tool is helpful. Uh, a bee brush is helpful and a smoker is helpful. Protective equipment, you know, again, sooner or later you're going to get stung but you wanna to try to develop uh, a, a working environment where that, that eventuality is minimized. So wearing protective equipment can be very helpful. So a bee suit, gloves, and a veil. And then of course you need the bees. Okay, we'll talk about uh, uh, that here more in a moment. If you grow to the, the uh, size where you're, you're going to be extracting honey, uh, you can certainly extract honey by just crushing the combs and collecting the honey. But it's much more efficient to actually collect the uh, honey through extraction. And to do this, an uncapping knife where you scrape the caps off of the, uh, the uh, comb that has the honey sealed within the cells is, is needed. And then an extractor to spin the frames and throw the honey out of the cells into the extractor. Now, uncapping knives and extractors are, are costly and there's a bit of skill required to use them effectively. It's been my experience that uh, it's a good situation for a hobby beekeeper to develop a relationship with a commercial beekeeper that has this equipment and that will allow them to, to uh, come in and use their equipment to, to uncap frames and to spin the honey out. Now, what about used equipment? You know, certainly used tools, used uh, protective equipment is fine, but be very cautious about used hives, used frames, uh, other wooden parts of, of, of um, the equipment because uh, used equipment frequently is available because something happened to the colony that was in that hive. You know, it, it died for whatever reason. And there can be situations where the, uh, the colony may have died as a result of a disease. And some diseases actually produce resting stages that are very durable, that are very hard to clean off of woodenware. And if you try to establish a new colony in this used equipment, you can actually have problems with, uh, with diseases then from that point on. Okay, let's watch some videos that uh, uh, describe some of the equipment and uh, tools and protective clothing that are, are helpful in getting started with bees.
I'm Patrick Byers, Horticulture Field Specialist with University of Missouri Extension. Let's talk about getting started in beekeeping. This is an example of a Langstroth hive, which is the most commonly used type of hive for beekeeping in the United States. Let's take a look at the components of a Langstroth hive. The first thing we have is, is the cover. This is sometimes called a telescoping cover because the sides telescope over the sides of the hive. Frequently it will have a metal top to it and then of course it's made out of wood. The next thing that we frequently see on a Langstroth hive is an inner cover. And this is the inner cover that is placed over the top of the supers. It gives the bees an area to congregate on top of the hive. And then we move into the body of the hive itself. This box on top is called a super. Now there are supers of different depths. This is a shallow super. A little bit further down we'll talk about deep supers. Within the super are the frames, and the frames of course are the part of the uh, hive where the bees build out the comb and store the honey. So here is our shallow super, and again this is where the honey will be stored. Within the super are the frames. The frames comprise the inner part of a beehive, whether it be a hive body or, or a honey super. Let's take a look at a frame and, and talk about the different parts. So typically a frame is built out of wood. There are plastic frames that are available now. The top part is the top bar, the bottom bar, and the side bars. Now within the frame is placed foundation. In this case it's a durable plastic foundation, but you can also use foundation that is made from rolled sheets of beeswax. The foundation provides a guide for the worker bees to draw out the honeycomb. The foundation is placed inside of the frame. There's a little slot along the bottom bar. Then at the top there is a detachable piece that is pressed against the, the uh, foundation and then nailed or stapled into place. Typically there are nine or ten frames in, uh, in each super. Now this is the part of the hive where the, the uh, worker bees will store honey. We don't want the queen up in this part of the hive laying eggs, so there frequently is a piece of equipment called a queen excluder. And the queen excluder is a mesh, stainless steel mesh, with just enough space to allow worker bees to pass through, but the queen of course, which is a, the largest bee in the colony, she's a little bit too large to pass through the screen, so this effectively keeps her in the lower part of the hive. This is the main part of the beehive. So these deep boxes are sometimes called deep supers, sometimes they're called brood boxes, or sometimes they're called hive bodies, but this is where the action takes place in a beehive. Within the, uh, the brood boxes, the queen is active. Uh, the worker bees will draw out the comb, forming the cells. The queen will lay an egg in the cell. The worker bees will provision the cell and then care for the brood until it becomes an adult bee. All of that takes place here in the, uh, the lower part of the hive. Frequently, there are two of these uh, deep supers that are used to comprise the body of the hive. As was the case with the honey super, within the uh, deep super, we have frames, again, nine or ten frames, and the worker bees will draw out the comb on those frames. A beekeeper will frequently provide two deep bodies, or, or two uh, hive bodies, for the colony. And this is because the queen tends to work upwards as she's laying eggs and uh, uh, maintaining the colony. And the beekeeper can then switch these out uh, top to bottom as needed during the season. Here we have two examples of hive bases. The uh, more modern type, as we see here, has a screen on. And this screen allows for uh, uh, varroa mites and other problems to drop out of the hive as the bees groom themselves. Uh, this particular one has an open bottom. This one here allows for the placement of a uh, bottom board that might have a, a sticky substance on to help trap things such as small hive beetles and varroa mites. Let's talk about the entrance to the beehive. Now, uh, there are some designs of bottom boards that allow for a sloping landing surface for the honeybees, and that's very helpful. As the worker bees are leaving the colony or arriving back with stores, it's nice to give them an area that they can land on to easily access the hive. Other designs just have a, a smooth landing surface here, but it is important to provide an area for the bees to land. 
There may be times during the uh, season where you want to reduce the size of the entrance to the hive. And that's done with a uh, entrance reducer, as we see here. This has slots of different sizes, depending on how much access you want to allow into the colony. And it's placed over the hive opening and then slid into place. You can see now that we've reduced the size of the opening to the small area here. This might be done in the winter time to, uh, to uh, uh, allow the hive to, to stay warmer, to allow less cold air into the hive, or it may be used with a weak hive to help reduce the area that the bees have to defend against uh, neighboring colonies that would be interested in robbing the colony. Let's talk about bee space. The Langstroth hive was revolutionary in that Lorenzo Langstroth recognized that if the components of a hive were placed the right distance apart, the bees would not build bridge comb or, or other types of comb that would interfere with pulling pieces out. And that space is about a centimeter, and we can see here between the frames in this hive, there's about a centimeter in space, and the bees will draw out the comb in the frames, but they won't connect the frames to each other. So the beekeeper can pull out individual frames and examine the hive. The space between components, between uh, the uh, supers, is also about a centimeter. And again, that allows the, that right amount of space for the bees to work, and they won't bridge across it from super to super, so that you can pull entire supers off of a hive if desired. There will be times when honeybees may need to be fed, and there are different designs as far as feeders for honeybees, lots of different techniques. Here's an example of a, uh, a way to feed honeybees that's a homemade version. The uh, sugar syrup is placed into a glass jar, and then the jar has a series of holes punched in the lid, and then it will slowly come out through those holes, and the bees can then feed on that syrup. Uh, the way that this one works is that we remove the telescoping cover from the hive, we remove the inner cover from the hive, we place this on where the inner cover was, and then we'll place a shallow super around it, and then we'll replace the telescoping cover on top. This way it's easy to access the, uh, the uh, jars to replenish the uh, syrup as needed. So let's review the parts of a Langstroth hive. First we start with the base, the uh, landing board. Then we have the hive body, or the brood boxes. On top of the brood boxes, a queen excluder. And then on top of the queen excluder, we have the honey supers. On top of the honey supers will be an inner cover. And then crowning it all will be the telescoping cover. The parts of a Langstroth beehive. I'm Patrick Byers, Horticulture Field Specialist with University of Missouri Extension. Let's talk about getting started in beekeeping. A beekeeper will need several basic tools. The first, of course, is a hive tool. Uh, the hive tool is useful for prying parts of the hive apart. It's also useful for prying out frames for examination. Uh, it's useful for scraping burr comb and, and other parts of the, the, uh, the uh, uh, wax that you might want to remove from the hive. The second piece of equipment is a bee brush. The bee brush has soft nylon bristles. It's useful for brushing bees off of an inner cover, brushing bees off of frames before examination. Opening a hive for examination is a disruptive process, and it's natural that the bees will assume a defensive behavior pattern. This is where the smoker comes in. The judicious use of smoke placed at the right place and at the right time will help disarm this natural defensive behavior of the honeybee. For example, the smoke disrupts the pheromones that honeybees produce when they're alarmed. The smoke also convinces the honeybees that there may be the risk that the colony is on fire. 
And as part of the uh, defensive mechanisms, they will begin to consume honey. And a bee that has consumed honey becomes more docile and easier to work with. So let's fire up our smoker. I prefer to use burlap to get things going and then pine needles to provide a good, cool, dense smoke. So let's get it lit here. Right. Now we'll go ahead and put some pine needles in. I collect pine needles in the fall when my white pines drop their needles so that I have a good supply. Again, look at the, the good quality smoke that this is producing. Now we're ready to, to work with our bees. So you want to use smoke judiciously. You don't want to use too much and you don't want to use it at the wrong time. But initially when you begin working with the hive it could be helpful to throw a few puffs across the entrance and then as you open up the inner cover throw a few puffs across there as well. Then wait. The bees again will become more docile after they consume honey and then you can start working with your colony. Now keep the smoker handy because there may be times where you need to apply a bit more smoke if the bees become belligerent. So bees will sting, and it's important that the beekeeper protect themselves from bee stings. It's been my experience that bees will find every chink in your armor, so you want to think carefully about how you're going to protect yourself from your feet, to the tips of your fingers, to the top of your head, your entire body. Let's talk first about gloves. Uh, a good pair of bee gloves is the right size. You don't want them too large or too small because that would affect your dexterity. Bee gloves frequently are gauntlet length, as we see here, to protect not just your hands, but your arm as well. And there's elastic at the cuff to hold it tight against your arm. Here's an example of a bee veil. The bee veil allows you to work with the bees to have clear vision, but still protect yourself from the bees. Typically, there's a, a ventilated hat that's worn, and then again, the veil itself is made out of nylon and metal screen. Now to protect your body from bee stings, you could certainly wear a heavy shirt and pants and, and perhaps boots and, and, and other articles of clothing, but to make the job comfortable and quite frankly, to give yourself better protection, it's a good practice to use a bee suit. And here's an example of a bee suit. Uh, typically these bee suits are light in color because it's a, a cooler job wearing them when you're working bees, especially during the heat of the summer. And in the case of this suit, the veil is actually integral with the suit. And we can see that right here. So let me demonstrate the uh, beekeeping equipment. So we'll slip on our coveralls. And then we'll put on the veil. And zip them up. And the final step is to zip up your veil. Okay, and then we'll put on the gloves. And again, these typically will go on the outside of your, the uh, cuffs of your uh, coveralls. 
I'll make a couple of additional comments on uh, what we just saw in the video. Uh, first of all, the fuel for your smoker. Uh, you certainly want to avoid uh, any treated wood. You want to avoid any petroleum-based uh, materials like synthetic fabrics or uh, uh, you know, anything that would be oil soaked in the smoker because it'll produce fumes that could, will injure the bees. And you also want to avoid uh, uh, fuel that would generate too hot of a fire. You don't want to turn your smoker into a flamethrower because that certainly will, will injure bees as well. Um, and then uh, from the standpoint of the, uh, the color of your coveralls, I, I favor white because it is cooler to wear white coveralls in the heat of the summer. But I've also been told that if you wear dark coveralls, there's some sort of primordial response of the bees to a large dark object as they would to a bear and, and uh, it can be more difficult to work bees in dark colored uh, clothing. So be a bit cautious about that. Now, how much does it cost to get started in beekeeping? Well, you know, it, it, it all depends, right? And if you're a, a carpenter and you have some raw materials on hand, you can certainly build the wooden parts of a, of a beehive. You could build the telescoping cover, you could build the inner, inner cover, you could build the uh, supers. Uh, it's best to buy the frames so that you can buy them broken down and put them together. But uh, many of the components you can, you can build yourself. Uh, accessory equipment, you could certainly purchase uh, used uh, bee brush, used uh, hive tool, used clothing. Um, as I mentioned, buying used woodenware is always risky, so be cautious about that. But here are some rough thoughts on what it might cost to get started in beekeeping. Well, the bees, uh, it can be free if you can capture a swarm or up to $350 if you buy a, a complete hive. The hive itself, $150 to $300. Uh, accessory equipment, your bee suit, your gloves, your veil, uh, your tools, that's gonna be somewhere between $100 to $300. And then hive treatment, we'll talk about Varroa here, but you need to plan on managing uh, some of the problems that can strike bees, and that includes Varroa mite. And, Hive treatment anywhere from twenty to two hundred dollars. So, again, as I mentioned in the the uh, second slide of the uh, our our time together, uh, there is a cost to to getting started in beekeeping. Now, where are you going to get your honeybees from? Uh, this is a cool picture. This was several years ago when I had the opportunity to capture a swarm that was up in a tree and climbed up on my truck, put a, a pile of boxes there, put a, a a hive body on top of that and shook them down into it and was just absolutely thrilled to get a new colony of bees. But uh, let's talk about where we can obtain honeybees. Well, we can certainly purchase a complete hive. Um, occasionally a, an established beekeeper will, will, will sell a complete hive and typically it's going to be one deep body, the 10 frames, and then uh, obviously the, uh, the bees and the queen within. And so this can be one way to, to uh, get started in, in beekeeping. A more common way is to purchase what's called a split. And beekeepers will frequently divide colonies in the spring. Uh, it has to be done at the right time. It has to be done as the bee numbers have built because you're essentially taking one colony and breaking it into two parts. And there have to be enough bees present to support both of the new colonies. Now, I mentioned earlier, there's only one queen per hive. What does this mean? Well, one queen will stay behind in, in uh, the, you know, one half of the split. The other part of the split has to include uh, frames that have eggs and young enough brood on that the worker bees can actually, by feeding these, these uh, uh, young brood or the, the uh, larvae that hatch out of the eggs that are present, they can actually direct their growth into new queens. And they can do this by, by uh, uh, changing the food that they feed the, uh, the uh, developing larva. The uh, developing larvae are, are, are fed something called royal jelly, whereas, whereas uh, worker bee brood are fed pollen. And so when the split is made, if there are some, some frames that have young enough brood or eggs in, the worker bees can sense there's no longer a queen in this new colony. They'll generate a new queen and then um, the uh, colony will move ahead from that point. Obviously there can be some failures in doing this and it's important to recognize that as well, but you can certainly purchase a split. An excellent way to, to start a new colony of bees is with a nucleus hive, and, and that's abbreviated as a nuke hive. And as I said before, it, it typically is made up of five frames and the bees that are attached to it, and then a queen is provided into the a nuke hive. And then this can be then transported easily, and then the entire nuke can be more or less emptied into a full-sized Langstroth body to, to start a new colony. Another way to obtain honeybees is to buy what's called a bee package. Uh, 
And here we can see an example of a B package. It's basically a screened box. And within that box, there's a number of bees, usually somewhere around uh, three pounds or so of worker bees. And then uh, suspended in the middle of that box is a can that contains sugar syrup. And again, that provides a, a food stock to, to keep the bees uh, active and, and healthy on the trip. And then within the box is also a smaller box that contains the queen. And you'll notice there in the lower picture, there is the, uh, the queen's box. And again, she has a, a little bit of, of uh, sugar candy to keep her happy. And the worker bees can, can keep her fed and watered through the screen. Now, in this sort of a setting, the uh, worker bees and the queen often are not from the same hive. Frequently what happens is a beekeeper will take a very strong colony, shake about uh, three pounds of bees into the box, and then place a different queen in the box with them. And then in the course of transporting the uh, package to the new home, they all become friends and, and become, you know, uh, the, the queen pheromones then become, begin to direct the activity of the uh, worker bees in the package. The package is put into a cardboard box and it can be then shipped through the mail. And it's always exciting to open up that package and bring out or open up the box and bring out the package of bees and, and install them into a, uh, into a uh, hive body. And then the, uh, the uh, fourth way to uh, start a new colony is to catch a swarm. And uh, catching swarms is so exciting. It's just, just from a beekeeper's standpoint, it doesn't get more exciting than catching a swarm. Uh, from the standpoint of the public, a swarm can be quite alarming. But if uh, managed properly, uh, there's very little risk to getting skin stinged in catching swarms. But again, it's, it's probably not something that is, is for a new, uh, uh, a new person in beekeeping or a novice. It's best to work with an experienced beekeeper to, to learn the techniques and, and see how it's done. I'm Patrick Byers, Horticulture Field Specialist with University of Missouri Extension. Let's talk about capturing a bee swarm. Well, if you've ever come across a swarm of bees, thousands of bees clustered together in a buzzing, pulsing mass, it can be an interesting experience. Realize that most of the time bee society takes place within the dark confines of a hive, but now all of a sudden, the bees have sought a new home and they're out in the open. Bees typically swarm in the spring or the early summer, and a swarm is an exciting event for a beekeeper. It's an excellent way to acquire the uh, start of a new colony of bees. Within the swarm is the, the queen and then a number of worker bees that have left with her. Typically a hive or a feral colony will swarm when the population begins to grow early in the season. And then as the uh, bees and the queen leave the hive, typically they'll settle down within oh, 100 feet or so of the hive and then they'll regroup. And then scout bees will fly out from the swarm looking for a new home. Well, again, this is an excellent opportunity for, uh, for capturing the start of a new colony. Now, swarms will typically land on a tree or a shrub. Usually they're about chest or head high, but sometimes they land high in a tree. Sometimes they land on the eave of a house or, or a building or, or someplace where it's difficult to reach them. So there may be some situations which is just not practical to try to capture the swarm. However, if it is accessible, it's definitely worth putting some effort into capturing it. Now, capturing a swarm is not something for a novice uh, or, or a first-time uh, beekeeper to attempt. There is some risk from the standpoint of, of, of stinging, and it's important to protect yourself adequately while you're doing the job. Oftentimes, uh, local beekeeping groups or, or an experienced beekeeper will place their number on call so the public can contact them when a swarm is sighted. And again, as I mentioned earlier, capturing a swarm is a wonderful thing from the standpoint of a beekeeper. Well, here's the process. Okay, once the swarm has been located, the first step is to find a suitable container to hold the swarm. Now, this could be an empty beehive. This is frequently done. Or it could be a cardboard box or, or perhaps a plastic tote or some sort of large size container. The key is that it have a lid, that it can, can obviously confine the bees, and that it's ventilated. Okay, if you've got to improvise on short notice, make sure that you have some ventilation in the uh, container so that once you've captured the swarm, they don't smother, especially on a hot day. Secondly, suit up, protect yourself. You do need a bee suit in case the bees get agitated. It's also helpful to have a bee brush. The a bee brush can help brush the bees off of whatever the swarm has lit on into your container. Okay, now 
Uh, sometimes you can actually cut the support if it's a small tree or something like that and bring that along with you. But in other cases, you may need to actually dislodge the bees from the, uh, the uh, area where they lit. Um, it can be helpful to spray the outside of the swarm with a sugar syrup. This will, again will help uh, uh, keep the bees within the mass of the swarm. It will help keep them from flying when you begin to do the process of dislodging the, uh, the swarm. Now, after you've dislodged the bees, make sure that they end up in your container. Be it a hive, if it's a hive, place it close underneath the swarm so that the bees end up in it. If it's a container or a box, try to place it so the swarm is enclosed when you dislodge the bees. But again, the goal is to capture as many of the bees as possible within your container. Uh, the next step is to uh, take a, 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 a look, stand back and observe and see what's happening once you have the bees within the container. Typically, the queen is in the mass of the bees and she'll end up in the container or in the, uh, the hive. If, however, she hasn't, then the bees will begin to, to, to become agitated. They'll, they'll try to climb out of the box. They'll try to move back to the location of the queen. And if this is the case, by all means, let them loose, uh, let them regather, and then you'll likely have another chance to, to uh, repeat the process. Uh, if you have the opportunity, wait for stragglers. Uh, leave your box in place or your, your container uh, for a period of time because there will be some bees that will be flying, and the scout bees, of course, will be out as well. And it can be helpful to allow them to return to the area where you've, you've uh, done the, uh, the swarm capture. And then finally, set up the new hive. <clears throat> it's always a good idea to have a hive uh, ready to go with, with foundation and frames uh, ready to go. Uh, because you never know when you'll have the opportunity to capture a swarm. At any rate, have that hive ready and then transfer the bees into the new hive within 24 hours of capturing them. In fact, within, within as short a period of time as possible from capturing the swarm. And then with a little luck, they'll settle down and you'll have a new colony. We brought the uh, swarm home inside of our can. We made sure that we kept it cool and certainly out of the sun. It would be very easy for the uh, swarm to get too warm in here and for the bees to suffocate. So now we're ready to place them into the hive. We have a hive that we previously prepared. It has a uh, foundation in place and hopefully the bees will find this an attractive home and will settle in very quickly. We'll remove some frames from the center so that we have room in which to place the swarm. It's been several days since we captured the swarm and attempted to install it in this beehive. Judging by the activity, the bees seem to have adopted this as their new home. We placed a reducing bar at the hive entrance to give them just a small area to go into and out of. We've also been feeding the bees with sugar syrup. We've not opened the hive to see how things are going inside. We'll do that here in several days. But based upon the activity, the bees seem to have adopted this as their new home, and we've successfully installed this swarm. Now, uh, if you're getting started beekeeping, how many hives should you have? Well, you know, like, like a lot of things, oftentimes you hear the advice start small, and that's, that's good advice for beginning beekeepers as well. But in my experience, you need more than one hive. And the reason for that is that part of hive management, there may be situations where you move frames from one hive to another hive. You know, for example, if you have a hive that is, is weak for whatever reason, moving uh, some frames of uh, brood and uh, capped bees, you know, you brush the uh, the uh, nurse bees off, you move them without bees adhering into a new hive, uh, then the bees that are in the new hive will then take charge of those and you'll get a burst of, of new bees coming into the population of the second hive. So there can be situations where you can move parts of the hive around to, to balance out the, the health and vigor of more than one hive. And you don't really have that option if you have just one hive. And, and two, it's been my experience that, you know, if your goal is to, to develop a, a backyard apiary, and you want to extract honey, uh, 
you know, having more than one hive is going to give you the likelihood of having a reasonable harvest of honey from your, your, your uh, apiary. So uh, my general advice is to have somewhere from two to five hives. That's a good level at which to start. One hive, yes, you can certainly start with one hive, but you'll have more fun with, with more than one hive. Where should you place your hives? This is a good question. Uh, in an urban setting, oftentimes we don't have a lot of choice, but if you have a rural property and you're trying to decide where to place the hive, here are some things to consider. Uh, keep in mind that your bees will forage some distance, uh, up to three miles, and you wanna set it up so that the activity in your hive doesn't interfere with other activities, either in your property or on surrounding properties. Um, We'll talk more about that when we get into the, the uh, discussion of urban bees, because that's definitely consideration in an urban setting. Bees require water, and they require a lot of water, particularly during the warmer part of the year. And that water should be relatively close. Okay, It's been a, a common source of concern uh, among neighbors of beekeepers when the bees from the neighbors end up drinking water from my pool or from my bird bath or you know from some other water source on my property. So provide a water source that is close to the hives that is, is reliable and clean. Full sun is best. Uh, thinking about the hive opening, uh, particularly in urban settings, it could be helpful to have a barricade that ensures that the bees fly up and over an area. You know, for example, if your bees are, are uh, close to a property line, perhaps a fence in front of the hive will force the bees to fly up and they'll then gain some altitude before they end up over the neighbor's property. And keep in mind that bees and livestock do not mix. So there have been lots of situations where, where goats or, or uh, horses or uh, cattle have pushed beehives over. It's, it's, it's best to isolate beehives from areas where livestock are kept. Okay, now let's turn our discussion to honeybee IPM. And in recent years, we've seen a number of uh, uh, pest problems become serious on, on, on uh, with honeybees and with bee colonies. And it's part of beekeeping to help manage these problems to the advantage of your honeybees. And uh, just a couple of things to point out in this picture here, we'll talk about this more later, but in the lower larger picture, the beekeeper is using a uh, bottom board that is screened and using a slide in board that slides below the screen, which she has placed a sticky substance on. And that is, is designed to catch varroa mites as the uh, bees groom them from their bodies. The uh, second picture over shows uh, small hive beetles. Those are the small dark beetles that are there amongst the bees. Uh, high enough populations of small hive beetles can be disruptive to a beehive. And there are various ways that we can manage small hive beetles without using pesticides in the hive. So here's an example of some of the uh, honeybee pests that have to be considered. And a number of these are, are not new problems. They've been around for some time, things such as uh, American fowl brood and nosema and chalk brood. But we are seeing the rise of, of uh, new problems such as um, these virus issues that are becoming a, a part of a, a sudden colony collapse disorder. Uh, these these uh, viruses are vectored by varroa mites and varroa mites in particular are a very damaging pest that is a recent arrival here in, in North America. Tracheal mites can be a problem as well, and then small hive beetles. All of these are newly arrived pests. They, they uh, have all arrived within the past 25 to 30 years. Then we have some, some larger scale uh, predators of honeybees, and these include uh, the uh, giant Asian hornet that we're hearing so much about. Um, yellow jackets will prey upon honeybees. There are hornets, though, other types of hornets that will prey upon honeybees. And then, of course, wax moths. The larvae of wax moths will destroy the comb within a uh, honeybee hive. And then there's some vertebrate pests. Mice will shelter within hives. Uh, sometimes snakes and lizards can be found within hives. Skunks can be very damaging. Skunks will camp out at the entrance of a hive and eat the honeybees as they come and go. There are birds that make a specialty of catching and consuming honeybees, particularly in the vicinity of the hive. Bears, of course, are, are a very damaging pest of uh, beehives. They destroy the hive. They they feed certainly on the, uh, the honey, but they're primarily feeding on the larval bees. And then of course, livestock will push colonies over and otherwise damage colonies. And then I mentioned humans, uh, you know, human activity, uh, certainly uh, uh, the use of pesticides can be a risk factor for, for honeybees.
Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on these pests because, again, that's subject matter for a series of workshops in their own right, but I will mention varroa mites. And I've heard beekeepers describe varroa mites as honeybee ticks. And quite frankly, that's what they are. They feed between the body segments of bees, both adult bees and larval bees in the cells. And uh, yes, they cause damage here, but another way in which they cause damage is that they spread viruses from one bee to another bee. They reproduce in capped pupil cells. And you can see them if the uh, infestation is heavy enough, you can see them on the, uh, the adult bees. And if you see that lower picture there, you can see that bee is, is uh, being parasitized by two varroa mites. The threshold is two to 3% of the bees within a colony having varroa mites. Now, how do you know if two to 3% of, of the bees in the colony have mites? It, uh, it's done by sampling, by collecting a known number of bees and, and sacrificing those bees and observing the uh, varroa mites that are present on the bees. And this can be done by, by placing a known number of bees into a sack and then placing alcohol in that sack and then collecting the varroa mites that, that, move, that are removed from the, the bees and counting them relative to the number of honeybees in the sample. But again, very damaging, very damaging pest, both in its own right, but also in the fact that it spreads bee viruses. Okay, let's talk about varroa mite integrated pest management. The first step, of course, in any integrated pest management strategy is to monitor the population of the pest. And again, you can see uh, the beekeeper here placing a sticky board over a screened bottom board. And uh, this is a good way to, to just quickly monitor if there are any varroa mite present in the colony. Most colonies have some level of varroa mite present in them. And oftentimes the first warning is by observing a sticky board under the, uh, the hive. If there is varroa mite present, then it's useful to sample a known number of bees, as I mentioned before, by uh, sacrificing those bees. You can do this with alcohol. You can do this with a shot of ether from a, a can of starting fluid or or you know, there's various other ways to do it, and then counting the number of varroa mites that are present. Uh, there are cultural practices that can help with management of varroa mite. Uh, resistant strains of bees, those strains of bees that are hardy, and those strains of bees that have hygienic behavior, where they tend to groom themselves more regularly and remove the varroa mite, uh, are, are, are good choices. And again, uh, bee breeders have been developing strains that have this hygienic behavior. Small cell comb, there's evidence that uh, using foundation that is just a tad smaller than traditional foundation will lead to cells that are a bit smaller and that these cells don't uh, uh, provide as good a uh, habitat for the uh, reproduction of varroa mite than a more a traditional size cell. And then something that's called brood break is helpful as well. Mechanical practices, you can actually trap mites within drone brood. Uh, drones are, are uh, uh, drone cells are larger than the cells for worker bees, and it also takes longer for the drone brood to develop. And so, uh, beekeepers are actually placing frames that have a special type of foundation that has the larger size cell for drones. The, the worker bees draw it out. The eggs that are laid in those drone cells um, uh, again hatch into drone larvae. They become infested with varroa mite. They're capped, and at that point the uh, cells are taken out and then they're destroyed. The, the, you know, we don't need the drones anyway, and we certainly don't need drones that have varroa mite within the cell that are reproducing. The screen bottom board is helpful. Powdered sugar, uh, dousing your, your powder or dusting your bees with powdered sugar can actually improve grooming behavior that act, helps uh, remove varroa mite. So that can be a, a mechanical way of managing uh, varroa mite as well. There are soft chemical practices using various aromatic substances such as thymol, formic acid, oxalic acid, and various acids found in hops can be helpful. And then there's amitraz, which is a hard chemical that can be placed in the hive at certain times. You have to be cautious with amitraz because it can contaminate honey. So it has to be used at the right time to help manage the varroa mite. Let's talk about colony collapse disorder for a moment. And in 2006, it was noted that just a tremendous number of colonies were lost during that winter. You know, in a, in a more typical situation, beekeepers expect to lose about 10% of their colonies in a, in a given year. But we had losses as high as 60% in, in that particular season and then during that winter. And then what was most unfortunate is that most of the feral bee colonies were destroyed. And uh, this brought, uh, first of all, uh, the problem obviously was, was a serious issue for beekeepers but it also brought the situation uh, 
uh, as far as the, the stresses the bees were facing to public awareness. And this was actually huge from the standpoint of, of uh, uh, putting public opinion on the side of beekeepers and helping address some of the, uh, the uh, factors that have led to colony collapse disorder. Now, uh, colony collapse disorder appears to be a complex. It appears to be a situation that arises when a colony is under several different stressors. Uh, it could be pesticide buildup in brood nests, and this could be uh, pesticides that are brought in as a result of foraging, you know, persistent pesticides that bees bring in either on their bodies or that might be present in nectar. It also can come about from lack of habitat, lack of forage, you know, for example, in situations where uh, uh, nectar and pollen forming plants have been eliminated. And then it's, it's certainly been tied to uh, the viruses that are vectored by Varroa mite. And so again, all of these are factors in colony collapse disorder. And uh, thankfully, uh, we're, we've seen some improvement in the situation. Uh, again, public awareness has played a role. Uh, we now see people who are deliberately planting habitat for honeybees. Um, and, and this obviously benefits not only honeybees, but also native pollinators. So planting habitat strips on farms or planting uh, pollinator gardens are all very helpful from this standpoint. Uh, reducing pesticide use whenever possible is certainly part of the solution to colony collapse disorder. And then uh, again, we've seen some changes, changes in public policy. You know, for example, we've seen changes in pesticide labels to highlight some of the risks in using pesticides relative to, to honeybees. And I think this is a very positive benefit and the people who are using these pesticides by law must abide by the provisions on the label. So I think that's very helpful. And again, this helps not only honeybees, but it helps all pollinators. Now, again, just to, to uh, review integrated pest management. And again, as, as beginning beekeepers, we have to understand that uh, we have to manage honeybee colonies for these problems. But again, uh, we wanna start with, with uh, physical management. Again, things such as hives on stands, proper angles of bottom boards, screen bottom boards, those sorts of things. Mechanical management, again, the using drone comb for, uh, for all mite management. Cultural management, uh, removing honey, processing promptly and, and managing uh, the, uh, the comb after honey extraction, very important from the standpoint of wax moth management, and then chemical management if needed. Use softer chemicals first. Uh, if you have to use harder chemicals, then use those as, um, as uh, uh, directed by the uh, label of the chemical. Well, now let's turn our attention to pollination. And particularly for those who are thinking about beekeeping on a larger scale, it can be, uh, a very lucrative aspect of beekeeping to provide pollination services. If we look at this basket of uh, produce, uh, a number of the items in this that basket are there as a result of uh, honeybee pollination. So we wanna recognize the value of honeybees and pollination. So again, this is a, a link that we've known about for a long time. Again, that, that honeybee human relationship uh, was based as much upon honey as it was upon pollination. And as far as uh, beekeepers deliberately providing pollination services, this began back in the early 1900s. Now, as uh, varroa mite has increased, we've seen a loss of feral bee populations. And this has had serious implications for, uh, uh, for example, fruit growers who are relying upon feral bees to pollinate their crops. When I first began my career uh, 35 years ago, it is now, uh, if you had a small scale orchard, in many cases, you didn't have to bring honeybee colonies into your orchard for pollination because you had lots of feral bee colonies in the vicinity of the orchard and they would they would pollinate your, your crop for free. But with the rise of varroa mites and particularly the colony collapse disorder, we've seen the loss of feral bee colonies. And that need, means that we now need to bring honeybee colonies, managed colonies into crops to provide for pollination. So again, the uh, plants that require pollination, it's a long list of, uh, of the uh, fruits and vegetables and, and, and other crops that, that, that we're associated with that we enjoy eating and that uh, are important parts of our diet. Now, in some cases like broccoli, we don't need pollination for uh, the harvest of the broccoli head, but we do need pollination from the standpoint of developing broccoli seed for the next crop of broccoli. So even something like broccoli where we don't eat a fruit or you know, a portion that was pollinated, we still have to have seed to grow that crop. And that's where honeybees come into to that place. 
this is an interesting map. Uh, the uh, states that are that are uh, colored in blue are states where there is large scale production of fruits and vegetables that depend upon pollination, and the uh, the arrows show the uh, migratory movement of beekeepers. You know, for example, uh, many colonies are overwintered in the southern U.S. in Texas and and Florida, and then they move out from there to different states in response to the pollination needs of crops. You know, for example, if we look at Maine, honeybees are moving to Maine to pollinate the low bush blueberry crop. Honeybees move to Michigan to pollinate crops like cherries, apples, and blueberries. And notice all of those arrows going to California. Well, what's happening in California is a huge event from the standpoint of pollination, and that is the almond bloom. And let's talk a little bit about almonds. So almonds by far have the greatest needs from the standpoint of pollination and migratory beekeepers. It's a crop that is entirely pollinated by honeybees and it's a huge crop. 70% of the world's almonds are produced in California. And again, uh, by the early 2000s, uh, almonds demanded more bees than any other crop. In fact, more than, than the combination of most other crops. And from January to March during the almond uh, blossoming, there are likely more colonies of bees in California than there are in the rest of the country. And in fact, we're getting close to a point where we don't have enough colonies, enough managed honeybee colonies that can be moved to California to supply the number of colonies needed to pollinate the almond crop. It's, it's actually close to a crisis situation. So again, in 2013, um, if you want to, some numbers, we needed 31 billion honeybees to pollinate the 810,000 acres of California's almond crop. That's more than 1.5 million colonies. And uh, again, as I mentioned, we're, we're at a, a situation where we're, we're reaching a shortage of colonies. And that, of course, has driven up the uh, cost per colony for the, uh, the people who are growing almonds. And uh, those people who are supplying uh, honeybees, honeybee colonies for pollination, it's a $240 million industry, $240 million industry. And an almond grower is gonna pay anywhere from 150 to $200 per colony each time one is set out. And you need, uh, you need several colonies per acre and a beekeeper can actually move colonies around in response to blooming of different cultivars, different regions in, in California. So. Again, a lot of interest in uh, migratory beekeeping into California to serve a single crop, the almond crop. What about migratory beekeeping in Missouri? Well, we don't have a lot of migratory movement of hives, but we do have beekeepers who will move colonies to pollinate uh, the almond crop in California. But much of our movement uh, here in Missouri is, is local. And we do have crops in Missouri that do uh, require uh, the uh, services of pollination, the services of, uh, of beekeepers, and those include melons, pumpkins, apples. Uh, there are some small fruit crops like strawberries and uh, blueberries and blackberries that benefit from uh, the uh, activity of pollinators, and there are certain vegetables in addition to uh, uh, melons and pumpkins as well. Uh, it's less expensive to rent a hive here in Missouri. It's going to be probably somewhere between $25 to $75 per colony. Watermelons, you need about one colony per acre. Uh, strawberries, one and a half colonies. Uh, apples, probably two to two and a half colonies per acre. And the exact number of, of hives needed depends upon several factors, such as the uh, topography of the orchard, the size of the orchard, and the, uh, the uh, uh, need for cross-pollination versus self-pollination. Now, just some general thoughts on, on serving a uh, fruit grower or someone else growing a crop, you don't want to place the hives until the crop flowers. In other words, about 10% bloom is the point where the uh, honeybee colony will pl be placed in the crop. You want to place the uh, hives in clusters around the field. Make sure that there's water available. As we mentioned before, water is crucial from the standpoint of honeybees. If any pesticides are being applied to the orchard or in the vicinity of the orchard, you must follow all label directions to protect the bees. And bees are vulnerable not only to insecticides, but also to other pesticides, such as herbicides and, uh, and fungicides. Uh, keep in mind that single pesticides are likely less lethal to bees than mixtures, and systemic insecticides are less lethal than topically applied products. In other words, something that's applied that uh, is less likely to contact the bee itself, it tends to be less, less toxic. And again, 
if you're providing colonies, you want to have a clause in your pollination contract that talks about pesticide use. And if the, uh, the uh, producer is intending to use a pesticide application, it's, it's good practice to notify the, the uh, beekeeper 24 hours prior to application so that those hives can be moved out of the, the uh, planting before the pesticide is applied. Okay, now in addition to pollination, there is uh, obviously the, the commercial potential of producing bee products. And this is a picture of, uh, that I gathered up just, just from what I happen to have at home. And you can tell I'm a, I'm a, a lover of bee products, but uh, things such as honey, beeswax, and uh, other bee products can certainly offer some economic potential for, for beekeepers. Let's talk about honey and honey products first. Um, honey is twice as sweet as sugar and it's all natural. I mean, what could be better than, than honey as, as a sweetener? Uh, honey bees convert nectar into honey. They collect nectar from a variety of blossoms and you can actually develop specialty honeys based upon the uh, nectar, the uh, type of blossom that the nectar was collected from. And if we look at uh, this picture here, you'll notice in the very center that bottle of honey says sourwood honey. Sourwood honey is a good example of a specialty honey. It's, it's, um, uh, there's just a small quantity available. It's collected from the uh, blossoms of the sourwood tree and Appalachia and the, the honey flow is a very short period of time, but it's a very valuable honey and it's a delicious honey. Uh, my favorite honey, quite frankly. But uh, uh, certainly specialized honeys offer opportunity. Now keep in mind that honey may crystallize, but it really doesn't spoil if it's stored properly. Um, as far as honey products, uh, you could certainly sell liquid honey as we see in that metal bottle. Over to the, uh, the uh, right is uh, an example of uh, creamed honey or whipped honey. And cream honey is, is uh, produced by uh, taking very small crystallized uh, particles of very small, very small crystals from crystallized honey and blending it with liquid honey. And then through the, the process, you develop a smooth spreadable product that again is absolutely delicious. In that case, that's a jar that I brought home from a trip to, to Hawaii that was made from, uh, from uh, ohia blossoms. And then in, you can also uh, market what are called comb honey products. And, that little bowl there is a couple of pieces of uh, comb honey. And this can be marketed as chunks of, of, uh, of comb honey that's cut out of frames, or you can, you can uh, produce comb honey in specialized uh, circular uh, frames placed into a honey super. You can also uh, collect chunks of comb honey and suspend it in jars of liquid honey. But again, lots of different options from the standpoint of honey and honey products. The other bottle there is actually a combination honey elderberry product that is being promoted as a health supplement. And there are health benefits to, to honey consumption. And when you combine it with elderberries, it's, it's hard to beat the, uh, the health benefits of, of that particular product. So again, uh, honey has been used for nutritional and uh, medicinal benefits for, for centuries. And obviously an antimicrobial nature to honeys. Honey can act as a preservative uh, it's been used to treat burns, ulcers, and bed sores. It has the same caloric count as sugar, but uh, honey contains more nutritive value than sugar. In other words, there's more in honey than just sugar. There are actually uh, pollen grains and, and, and other substances that, uh, that have nutritive value. Raw honey is easier to digest and provides quick energy. Uh, pasteurization can be done with honey to retard crystallization, but there is some evidence that pasteurization can actually destroy enzymes and nutrients that are naturally found in honey. So uh, keep that in mind. Uh, raw honey, there's definitely a market for that, even though it does tend to crystallize more readily than pasteurized honey. Um, you can buy honey directly from beekeepers, from farmer's markets, from a retailer. Again, there's, there's lots of, of ways that a beekeeper could, could sell honey and honey products. Another important bee product is beeswax. And bees produce wax from glands in their abdomens. And uh, particularly with uh, newly established colonies and swarms, they can produce large quantities of wax in a fairly short period of time. And, and obviously when we think of beeswax, we think of candles, but beeswax is also used in facial creams, lip balms, soaps, lipsticks, uh, various other cosmetics. And it has a use in pharmaceuticals. Uh, it's used in, for, for dental applications too. And, and also for building. 
And uh, I always remember my grandmother, uh, she would keep a, uh, a button of beeswax close at hand and she would wax her threads as she was uh, quilting because it helped the thread slide easily through the fabric as she was quilting. So again, another use for, for beeswax. Other bee products, so from the standpoint of commercial production, there is a market for, for bee pollen. And uh, bee venom, interestingly enough, has medicinal benefits. And there is some interest in research into uh, some of those medicinal aspects of bee venom. Uh, you can, there's a market for the bees themselves from the standpoint of producing nukes or split colonies. Propolis, which is, again, that material that I mentioned before that bees use to uh, glue portions of their hives together, actually has some medicinal benefits as well. And it's used in uh, uh, toothpastes and, and, and other preparations. And then royal jelly, which is the, uh, the uh, uh, foodstuffs that uh, worker bees develop to feed developing queens. Uh, work, royal jelly has some medicinal benefits as well. So again, these are other bee products that could be produced and marketed. Well, let's talk a little bit about bees in the city. And uh, you know, those of us who are beekeepers, those of us who, who understand bees recognize that there really is very little risk if bee colonies are managed and placed properly in an urban setting. But even so, for a, a good part of the public, the uninformed public, the idea of bees being close at hand is a bit scary. So it's important to, to think about some of these aspects before we start establishing colonies in urban settings. So the first step, of course, is to check the city ordinances. Uh, there are cities that have been very proactive in allowing uh, urban beekeeping. And then there's others who have laws in the book that prohibit beekeep, bees, bee colonies within city limits. So it's important to check the city ordinances first. Secondly, always, always have water available close to the colonies. As I mentioned before, nothing is more, uh, more uh, annoying to neighbors than having bees clustering around a swimming pool or, or a fountain or, or uh, a bird bath. And if you don't have water available, bees will seek it out. Position hive openings away from the neighbors. If, if possible, turn hive openings to the center of your property rather than towards the neighbors. Do what you can to alter flight patterns. As I mentioned before, if you place a barrier in front of the hive, it'll force the bees to fly up and gain altitude as they move out on their foraging flights. Educate your neighbors, invite them over to, to check out your hives and share with them some honey and and just talk about bees and how exciting and how interesting they are and how valuable they are from the standpoint of pollination. And uh, before long, who knows, you may make some converts and pretty soon your neighbors will be keeping bees. And then again, very important to keep gentle bees only. You know, focus on those strains that are known for their gentleness. You certainly don't want bees that are aggressive or that are, uh, that are um, uh, it, where it's easy to trigger defensive reactions among the, uh, the uh, bees in the colony. This is an interesting picture here. I had a chance to visit a community garden in Kansas City that had several beehives. And you know, you think about uh, beehives in a community garden, and you can you, know, you can think about some potential problems. But this garden was very proactive, and they actually placed their hives on top of tall poles. These poles were about 15 feet off the ground, and this did a couple of things. Obviously, it altered the flight patterns of the bees so that they were well up into the air as they moved into and out of the hive. Uh, secondly, it kept the uh, hives up where they were protected from vandalism. And that certainly is a consideration in a community garden. Now, it was possible to raise and lower these colonies so that, uh, that the uh, uh, community gardeners could examine the bees. These were actually telescoping posts. I thought it was a very creative way to, uh, to have bees present in a community garden setting. Well, I thought I'd uh, check out the uh, laws in Springfield, Missouri, and I, I couldn't find uh, anything more recent than 2014. But according to the, uh, the uh, uh, Springfield Public Library and their listing of uh, beekeeping laws, this is what the laws read in Springfield, Missouri. You are allowed two hives on a lot that is at least 5,000 square feet, which is nice because as I said before, it's nice to work with more than one hive of bees. And for every additional 5,000 square feet of property, you can have an extra hive. So again, if you have a large city lot, there may be the potential to have several hives. Secondly, you have to know what you're doing. The law actually requires persons owning a hive to provide proof that they've had at least two years of experiencing managing a colony of bees without reported incidents, or they've completed a beekeeping training course through a beekeeping association, 
an academic institution or through a university extension program. And then all hives must be labeled with the owner's name and address. Okay, so that's the first part. And here's the second part. The beehives must be located in rear yards. So you can have bees in your backyard, but not in your front yard, at least five feet from all property lines. The hives must be inside a fenced enclosure that is at least 42 inches high. Again, here's an effort to alter the flight patterns of the bees and also to protect the bees from, from vandalism or from uh, perhaps children you know, getting too close to the, uh, the hives. If the hive is located within 20 feet of a property line, a six foot tall barrier that extends at least 20 feet in both directions is required. Again, an effort to alter flight patterns so that the bees are well up into the air before they move across a property line. And then a usable water supply for the bees should be located on the owner's property. And again, as I said before, that just makes common sense. So yes, it is possible to keep bees in Springfield, Missouri. In fact, uh, I would encourage you to consider it if you're an urban beekeeper in Springfield. So we'll close out with some five common mistakes to avoid. A first step, I'm not sure why I am keeping bees. <laughs> well, before buying the, uh, the, the first piece of woodenware or, uh, or uh, considering where you're gonna source your honeybees from, make sure you know why you're keeping bees. Are you a hobby beekeeper? Are you a backyard beekeeper? Or are you perhaps thinking about commercial scale beekeeping? And the reason this is important is because this is going to guide, first of all, your training. And then secondly, uh, you're going to have to be thinking about things in addition to just keeping bees, if you're thinking about the commercial aspects of keeping bees. Secondly, there's only one way to keep bees. That's certainly not true. There are lots of ways to keep bees. As I uh, mentioned in the presentation, just looking at different types of hives alone, lots of different types of hive construction, lots of different uh, uh, types of bees to keep, lots of different ways to actually manage hives. Third, I need to learn everything about bees before I start. Well, it's certainly good to have some basic understanding of beekeeping, but a lot of, of uh, beekeeping skills come with practice. They come with hanging around other beekeepers and they come with jumping in and, and buying or, or establishing that first colony and then that second colony and, and learning about what beekeeping is all about. So you don't have to know everything before you, you start. Uh, fourth, I have to have all of the equipment. I've got to have all the bells and whistles. I've got to have everything. Well, that's certainly not true. As I mentioned in the videos, yes, you do need some woodenware. Yes, you do need some basic protective equipment and some basic tools. And yes, you do need honeybees, but that's basically all you need. And you don't have to, again, you can keep the cost under control. And finally, I don't want to spend money on bees. Well, you will have to spend some money on, on your, your uh, beekeeping hobby. Uh, there is a cost to, to establishing bees, to purchasing the woodenware, uh, purchasing the equipment and tools and, and the bees themselves. But again, there are ways that you can keep the costs under control. But beekeeping is not an inexpensive hobby. There are some costs to consider. So at this point, I'd like to thank everyone for joining us for the webinar this evening. Uh, it's been a pleasure to be with you and, and share my passion with uh, beekeeping with you. And, and uh, I greatly enjoyed the interaction with the audience and appreciate uh, you spending your evening with me to talk about beekeeping.